sorry. I would like to call the Prince William County School Board meeting to order. Um, a motion is in order for the approval of the closed session agenda. Do I have a motion? Ms. Jesse? I'm not in. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jesse? I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? I second. Ms. Ralston seconds. Any discussion? Please vote. What's wrong with my. Hold on a minute, please. Mr. Chairman. Can you guys um, please help? I assume without objection, it passed. So, vote, vote for everybody. For Moving on to the motion to enter closed session, a motion is in order. Um, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Rawls, uh, Jesse. I move that pursuant to code 2.2-3711, the Prince William County School Board in a closed session for the following reason. One, to discuss and consider the assignment, appointment, performance, disciplining, and resignation of specific employees, appointees, or officers of the Prince William County School Board under Virginia Code Sections 2.2-3711A, 1, and 8. Two, to consult with Division Council and staff regarding specific personnel matters and threaten or impending litigation under Virginia Code 2.2-3711A, 1, 7, and 8. Three, to evaluate and set performance goals for employee T20 to, to 26 and, T, and employee T20 to 27. Four, to discuss and consult with Division Council a legal matter regarding personnel T20 to 30 and the Virginia Code 2.2-3711A, 2, 2 1, 7, and 8, and 5, to review the grievance appeal of employee T19-79 under Virginia Code 2.2-3711A, 1, and 8. Do you have a second? Second. Uh, Ms. Wall seconds. Any discussion? Please vote. Vote is seven yes, one absent. Wilk, motion passed. The Prince William County School Board will now enter closed session, returning in approximately one hour. go to 9.01, which is the approval of the closed session consent agenda. A motion is in order. Ms. Mr. Jesse. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the closed session consent agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ralston. Second. And any discussion? Please vote. Vote is seven yes, one absent. Wilk, motion passed. Next, we'll. Oh, um, point of order here. Uh, we're not going to vote on certification because we're going back into closed session, or do we certify once and certify again? You should certify this, this closed session. Yeah, Ms. And then McGowan. then certify the second closed okay, session. Okay, so we do. We certify this closed session, then we'll certify the second one as well. Okay, so we will. Thank you, Ms. Urban. You're welcome. Uh, moving on to closed session certification, a motion's in order. 10.01. Ms. Uh, Williams? 
Mr. Chairman, I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3712, the closed session of the Prince William County School Board meeting of February 5th, 2020, be certified by adopting the following resolution. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements were discussed in the closed session meeting, to which the certification certif certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed session meeting were heard and discussed or considered by the school board. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Ralston seconds. Discussion? Please vote. The vote is seven yes, one absent. Wilk, motion passed. In response passed. to community request to hear more about the many good things happening in our school division, our schools, we have continued to kick off our meetings uh, in, uh, during the school year with the Positively PWCS presentation. Tonight's Positively PWCS highlights how one school is using technology to enhance learning for students. Superintendent Dr. Waltz will introduce our presentation. Dr. Waltz. Thank you, Chairman Latif, members of the board. I'm very impressed with the improvements we have made in PWCS in the area of technology. I recently had the opportunity to have a fantastic visit to Bull Run Middle School and to witness the one-to-one -one program in action in classroom after classroom, and all I can say is, wow, it was truly an amazing day. It's uh, fantastic to see our teachers and students doing uh, technology across the curriculum and in many different ways to help their learning. Tonight, Principal Matthew Fithian is here to share more about this incredible program at Bull Run Middle School with his staff and students. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Waltz, Dr. Latif, and members of the school board. As Dr. Waltz said, I'm Matthew Fithian. I'm the principal at Bull Run Middle School. I'm here tonight to share the positive results of our newly implemented one-to-one -one device program with our eighth grade students that we've implemented this school year. Joining me tonight is Nisha Elam to my left, our instructional technology coach. We have Jordan Crandall, our eighth grade science teacher, and also department chair. And I'm very excited to share with you our technology implementation program at Bull Run Middle School. My vision for implementing one-to-one -one devices and technology for our students is to provide equal access to all of our students across uh, all of our grade levels and to provide a high level of learning using 21st century learning skills and experiences. The school's goal is to provide students and teachers with a flexible and effective learning environment that is structured and organized and able to reach all students. As part of this initiative, our teachers work together to plan, design activities in the content area to promote authentic learning experiences and the use of technology. It's my goal and hope to expand this opportunity to all students at each grade level over a three-year period based on the successes that we've seen so far this school year. As a teacher, I strive to promote engagement and access to information for all of my students across all learning levels. Historically, though, this has been difficult and usually requires that I break class time down into stations in which I can transition between various groups or students to meet their needs and challenge them academically as learners. However, through the various technology tools and access to devices that we have used in the classroom and at home for students at Bull Run, we have made this goal much more attainable on a regular basis. In class, students have access to their notes through YouTube. They watch short videos that they can rewind, replay, or review whenever, wherever, or as often as they like. They also have access to a digital notebook, which is hosted on Microsoft Office OneNote. This program allows students to work on practice pages, keep copies of important class documents, and is also where I can share additional links and sources for students. Best of all, it cannot be lost or conveniently left behind in a locker. <laughs> students also regularly use assessment tools such as Socrative and Plickers in class, which provide explanation and allow for differentiation. Programs like Socrative allow me to make individual assessments based on students' learning needs without singling them out. It also reduces the amount of time students spend waiting for feedback so that they can continue to grow as learners in class. Examples of flickers and feedback. 
By utilizing these tools in my classroom, students immediately gained greater differentiation. They are able to access sources that better support different learning styles, pro uh, provide translation opportunities, promote extension activities for gifted learners, and it encourages students to become independent learners practicing skills and positive practices uh, for their future careers. Best of all, it allows me to work around the room and answer complex questions and provide individual support for students that need it. Our one-to-one -one program has really allowed us to better integrate the five C's, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, communication, and digital citizenship, which not only has academic benefits for the students today in our classroom, but really prepares them for life beyond the classroom. Through this initiative, we've been able to meet students at their level and really develop deeper, more meaningful relationships with them as the teachers provide personalized feedback and work with the students on an individual basis. The skills our students are learning are also extending beyond the classroom into their personal life as they navigate how to appropriately use their cell phones and navigate the world of social media. We'd like to show you some brief examples of the work our students are creating through our technology integration program. In this first example, students were asked to create advertisements using Adobe Spark Video. These advertisements were persuasive in arguing either for or against the idea of a population law, which was a concept discussed when they read the book Among the Hidden. Roll tape, please. That was just a brief sample. Um, now we'll see the opposing viewpoint. Project students were really able to develop real-world connections in a way that was meaningful to them and make those connections additionally to the text. In this next example, students use the Flipgrid app in their math classes to solve multi-step problems with fractions. This allowed students to act as the teacher, really demonstrating their understanding of the process and also allowed the teacher to see any areas of misconception that may need further cl clarification. The problem is 1 and 7 eighths times 2 thirds. So now you change the mixed number into an improper fraction. You do 8 times 1, which equals 8. Then you do 8 plus 7, which equals 15. And you keep the denominator the same. So it will equal 15 eighths. The one-to-one -one pilot programs allows teachers to create individual learning experiences for students and also build relationships through differentiation for our students. And the, uh, the great thing is teachers can provide timely and essential feedback to students to help promote their own learning. I want to thank you for your time tonight and your continued support of our students. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Um, thank you. Wait, don't escape yet. <laughs> I think that this is a wonderful program. Um, I think that most of our students, uh, a lot of the technology that was utilized in this program is something that they're already pretty familiar with. My question is, how much training did the teachers have, or how much of a requirement or learning curve is it for the teachers? Um, because I know our students outside of the classroom, I mean, we already have flipped classrooms in existence within the school system. Kids are already creating videos with TikTok and other applications. So I'm wondering if this was uh, the benefit from the, the teacher standpoint, aside from not having to actually review paper, but the technology was a training professional development. So um, when we went through the process, uh, we had uh, ongoing discussions with our school teachers, our leadership team. We also had discussions with our school advisory council in terms of getting feedback and getting prepared for this. A lot of the teachers uh, throughout the summer did do some individual training. Um, this school year, uh, Nisha and myself and our teachers created a year-long ongoing staff development for our teachers through faculty meetings and our monthly grade level meetings. So our focus is uh, technology tips, technology
technology integration, and we introduced something new at all those meetings. Um, recently, uh, we did a survey with our teachers uh, to get um, their feedback on how that was going, and the uh, results were very high in terms of uh, the type of professional development that was given, and their response to it was uh, um, probably in the 90% level of uh, positive responses. And just one follow-up question, too, for did it reduce your, we hear a lot about teachers um, spending time doing tests and quizzes and things of that nature when they really want to be interacting with students. Do you feel that your interaction time went higher because of this? You want to talk about that? So yeah, I would say that my interaction time with students uh, definitely increased with this program. There is some front-loading that comes with creating the specific needs for my class and in relation to putting the videos together and making those kind of things for the kids. But once those are done, it completely opens me up to be able to work with those kids and reach, I'm really reaching everyone, where before I was trying kind of grasping at straws to get to everyone before. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Jesse. Hi, I just want to thank you for presenting because you know, we're often telling teachers, we tell teachers you need to differentiate and how do we do it? And I think this is a way of doing it. And we always talk about project-based learning and it's something that we need to do more to, to share with teachers and provide the professional development they need to engage in these things. I was at a uh, meeting with teachers and uh, she said, the principal said, okay, go ahead and do rigor and do differentiation. And I, I just want to share, thank you for sharing that with the board. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fithian. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank um, you. Next, we'll move to, um, I would like to call the meeting of the Prince William County School Board to order. There'll be a moment of silence at the request of Justin Wilk of the Potomac District. And we'll do that now. Thank you. Um, if there's a student in the crowd who can come up to the podium and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Any student? Any student? Anyone? Okay, how about no. Tahira Hamidi, our new student board rep. Please lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, so as we um, kick off tonight's meeting, you're seeing the posters. Um, some of the students from our many different schools have put up posters to celebrate, I guess it's school board appreciation week or month or day, excellent. Thank you very much to all our students who did a great job with this fabulous artwork from um, all our magisterial districts, so thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause, please. I would like to welcome Tahira Hamidi, our student rep, as she attends her first council or board meeting, um, and we have two board members. And they will be alternating, um, I think, every month is what we said. So we look forward to hearing your comments tonight. So welcome. Thank you, Tahira. Next, we'll go to the um, item 14.01, the approval of the public meeting agenda. There's a motion in order. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move the Prince William County School Board adopt, um, excuse me, approve the public meeting ad consent agenda as recommended. Do I have a second? Ms. Ralston seconds. Any discussion? Please vote. And as you're voting, actually, um, one of the things here on our consent agenda is our um, celebration of our um, clerks. Right, yeah. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. We're doing that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm voting. Me, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So we'll do that while we're voting for the next one. Vote is seven yes, one absent. Will, motion passed. Outstanding. Um, moving on to um, the adoption of the consent agenda. A motion's in order. Ms. Williams. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I move that the Prince William County School Board approve the public consent agenda. It should be adopted, approved the, as, as recommended. Do I have a second? Ms. Wall. 
Seconds, Ms. Wall. And uh, any discussion? Great. So while you're voting, please vote. I would like to, uh, one of the things in our um, consent agenda is to uh, appreciate our clerk and our, our, our um, of the school board and our deputy clerk. We would like to take a moment tonight to recognize our school board clerks. The Virginia School Board Association has designated the week of February 17th as School Board Appreciation Week to build an awareness of the role board clerks fulfill. The Prince William County School Board would like to join the VSBA, that's the Virginia School Board Association, in recognizing the many and varied contributions of school board clerk and deputy clerk. They do a wonderful job and put forth a tremendous amount of effort in serving our school board members, school staff, students, and the community. Mrs. Debbie Urban and B. Simpson, would you please come forward, come over here, and I have a, a lovely certificate that the board would like to present to you. And so on behalf of the board, Mr. Chairman. Oh, Ms. Jesse. Uh, it's, I'm sure that it was pr perhaps on another agenda, but it's not on this consent agenda. But I want to also remind everyone that this is Black History Month. I think we had it on last week's, but, but okay, Ms. Williams. Um, and, and I also, as I do every year, would like to thank you. My normal phrase is for. Uh, being ever so gracious as to hurting all of us board members, like, because it's like hurting cats, and I am guilty of that myself. So I just wanted to say an extra special thank you um, on behalf of being an administrator for my professional career. I understand sometimes how difficult we make your lives. So um, this being my sixth going to seventh year, I just really want to extend a personal thank you while we had the opportunity to do so in public. And then in addition to that, I know that it is uh, national Counseling, Counselors Week, and um, also in recognition of upcoming uh, Women's History Month for the public, we usually vote on these items in the consent agenda. They're about a month ahead. As Ms. Jesse said, it's Black History Month. We did that last month in our last our last board meeting, um, but it's still in effect now. In case anyone is wondering why we have not officially recognized it. No, excuse me. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the student. Well, it sounds different now that the door is open. Um, Student time, uh, we have Tahira Hamidi, who is our student representative. Um, Tahira, take it away. Um, I'd like to start by taking the opportunity to thank, thank the school board for allowing me the opportunity to um, represent my students. Um, I'd like to start by the issue with school lunches. Um, it has come to my attention that school lunches are highly priced. Um, breakfast is $1.50 and reduced breakfast is 40 cents. Um, looking at lunch, it depends on the level of school you're at. Elementary school is at $2.50, middle school is at $2.65, high school is at $2.75, and reduced lunch is 40 cents. So this means that a typical high school student who pays for both breakfast and lunch regular price is spending $4.25 daily. Multiply that by 180 and you get that high school student spending $765 a year. And that's not taking into consideration any other siblings they may have in the school. Um, I also sent out a survey to my classmates and students outside of Freedom High School. Um, 148 people participated in this essay, uh, sorry, survey, and there is one representative from every high school. Um, out of that 148, 48.6% of the students uh, said they were on free lunch, and 51.48 of the students said they paid for lunch, which is 76 of them. Out of that 76, 43% of them said that they skipped lunch because they did not have the resources to pay for it or they could not pack their own lunch. Uh, and 57% of them said that they packed their own lunch. However, if they missed out on the opportunity to pack a lunch, they would end up skipping lunch. Another issue brought to my attention is that it's the, in the school cafeterias, there's a lot of food waste being generated. In that same survey, 31.8% of people claimed that they never trashed food. 5.4% claimed that they trashed food once a month. 26.4% claimed that they trashed food once a week. And unfortunately, 21.6% of students claimed that they trashed something every day. Um, there were 14.9% people who percent of people who picked other, but this was mostly people who did not buy school lunch at all. A solution to this problem could be setting up something known as a food sharing service. This has already been set up in high schools like Garfield and ba uh, Battlefield. Um, 
A food sharing service simply is where at the end of a student's lunch shift, any unopened and uneaten food can be donated to a designated area that's um, decided by the school. This would have to have an adult sponsor, and um, there are many ways this can be run. One would be just starting a club and having student volunteers do it. Another way would be to give it to a different activity, club, or sport every month, week, however the school wants to break it down. Um, this will not only help getting rid of food waste, but it's also better for the environment because food that ends up in the landfill does contribute to methane levels in the atmosphere, and methane is one of the most potent CO2 um, car, uh, greenhouse gases. Um, I'd also like to thank Mr. Adam Russo, who took his time to meet with me and to explain some of the... Um, just some of the technicalities that comes along with it and how we need to make sure that the food is clean, unopened, and untouched. Um, moving on to the Student Senate, just a refresher, the Senate is composed of one student from every high school in Pennsylvania County. So far we have had two meetings and we are working on an agenda for the third meeting. In those two meetings we have been able to establish committees. The point of the committee is to um, focus students' attention as, and as to not spread out any student too thin. The four committees we are focused on this year includes mental health, which focuses on later start times, teacher awareness, and increasing communication between the teachers, students, uh, admin, counselors, parents, anyone involved in the student's education process, and mental health days, which Ben explained at the last school board meeting he spoke at. Our second committee is equity. This focuses on equal facilities at every school, especially the older schools, making sure our ESOL students have equal opportunities and resources, making sure technology is equal at every school. For example, Forest Park is known for being an IT school. However, their technology is a little lower than the other schools in the county. We want to make sure the water fountains do have a um, water bottle option and that every bathroom has a blow dryer in it. Our third committee is education. This includes parent involvement um, with things like the hub, student view, parent view, making sure that they know the resources that are there for their students. Uh, getting elementary school and middle school input and trying to bridge that gap between transitioning to each school level and making sure that those same students know what specialty programs are offered to them so they can take advantage and get the best education they possibly can. The last committee we're focusing on this year is the Unity Committee. Um, this is focusing on events like cross-county uh, events, um, I night or International Night, and a uh, music festival, the SPED Ball, making sure our special education students do get equal opportunity to experience the high school, the real high school experience. And we'd like to get SCA collaboration in this within the different schools. Um, Prince William is doing an amazing job making sure everyone's voice is heard. However, they are missing a key component, and that would be the teachers. In order to solve this, I would like to propose a teacher senate. Um, this could function the same way the student senate does, making sure they get uh, teacher input and letting the teacher's voices be heard. Um, a way this could be run is just like the student senate, we could get one representative from every school. However, we would include the high school, uh, middle school and elementary school levels. This would result in having about 96 senators. If that happens to be too much to handle, we can do what I like to call cluster schools, where we pick a high school, middle school feeders, and elementary school feeder, feeders, and get one teacher from every level. Um, I am aware that there is an organization already established known as a PWEA. However, this is not as effective as it could be because Virginia is a right to work state. Um, moving on to my main focus as my role as a student representative is something that I like to call student decriminalization. Um, simply known as trying to lower the amount of stu students being put out of school. Um, something a lot of people like to uh, mention with this topic would be the school to prison pipeline, which is simply pushing students into law enforcement and using suspension and expulsion as a form of punishment as opposed to a form of providing safety for the students. A way to move away from this is to focus on the good. It has become a trend that when something goes wrong, it tends to get publicized a lot more than anything good, which ends up just getting swept under the rug. For example, an alum at Freedom High School, graduated class of 19, Ikrenur, received a full ride to Harvard University. Same class, Christopher Sullivan received a band scholarship to NSU, Norfolk State University, and is only paying $1,000 per a semester at school, per a year at school. Um, moving a little closer to us, um, recently at the VHSL1 drama competition, Potomac placed second, and two of their students received best actors. Small things like that and so much more get pushed under the rug, and the only thing that gets known is the negativity. Um, another thing we could do is focus on fixing the problem at the root. As opposed to just seeing what the student did and automatically signing them some sort of disciplinary action, figure out what the cause of the problem is, get rid of that cause as to stop that problem from ever happening again. Um, in order to do this, we need to build better relationships between the students and the staff, admin, everybody that works with them. 
Um, I'd also like to thank Ms. Dara Duggar, who is the Director of Office of Student Management and Alternative Programs for meeting with me and discussing how to solve this problem. Um, moving on to Ben and Eliana. Ben is the other student representative and Eliana is our alternate. Uh, ben is focusing on mental health and later school start times and Eliana is focusing on equal opportunities for our special education department. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hamidi, thank you so much. That was excellent. Uh, moving on to citizen comments on the agenda and non-agenda items. It looks like we have 20 people this evening, um, and so we will do them all. Um, I will go ahead and call the first 10 names and ask you to – actually, what, what we'll do is we'll just call you up by one by one because it's so crowded. Um, you'll have three minutes to speak, and the clerk will keep the time. The lights on the monitor will indicate your progress. The yellow light will signify you should sum up your position. Red indicates time is up and you should stop. Please use proper decorum manners while at the podium. If you do not do so, you'll be asked to step aside. Please give your name, address for the record when you approach the podium. When we do hit the red light and I ask you to please stop, it's not because of what you're talking about and I'm just trying to keep everyone on the same track, so please forgive me as I do that. Our first speaker um, is Jenna Monaco. Hi, good evening. My name is Jana Monaco. My address is 3175 Iron Horse Drive uh, in Lake Ridge, Virginia. Um, thank you, Dr. Waltz, for having me here tonight and um, school board members. Um, as a parent of four children, educated in Prince William County Schools, I am honored to be here because 18 years ago, I watched my then three-and-a-half-year-old son, Stephen, go from a healthy, happy toddler to a comatose patient on life support in a matter of 24 hours. He received a diagnosis of a rare metabolic disorder that was detectable at birth, had his condition been on the newborn screening panel. It is now. However, the diagnosis came too late to prevent severe brain damage, disabilities, and complex medical issues. A year later, my daughter Caroline was born with the same condition. And thanks to awareness, early detection, and treatment, she is a healthy, thriving junior at Woodbridge High School. This personal experience led me down a path of advocacy for expanded newborn screening in rare diseases on the state and national level, passing legislation along the way. As I advocate for them and the one in 10 Americans living with a rare disease, I see the many children affected, all of whom face their own unique medical challenges and struggles to find information, support, and treatment, struggles that can impact them both socially and academically. I couldn't help but think of other children in Prince William County who either have a rare disease or a family member or a friend with a rare disease. It can be quite isolating, but it doesn't have to be. I want to change that and bring rare disease awareness to our county schools, beginning with the Rare Disease Day. Please join me and many others around the country and the world in promoting Rare Disease Day and rare disease awareness by implementing this exciting opportunity in our schools. It's always the last day in February around the world, and leap year is extra special since it too is rare. My vision is to see every school sign share Rare Disease Day and for all schools to begin the discussion of how we can promote rare disease education and awareness. There are endless ways to get involved and I'm happy to help lead that discussion. By doing so, Prince William County would be the first in the country to implement a countywide Rare Disease Day initiative. One central theme is Wear Your Stripes campaign because the zebra is our official symbol because of their unique stripes, like the diseases, yet they have shared commonalities, just like our students. So be creative, wear your stripes, and imagine empowering a student with this year's theme of rare is many, rare is strong, and rare is proud. Thank you, Dr. Waltz, for caring for this side of children and students who often go unnoticed and because it is so silent and so rare. Thank you for your time. Michelle Nikolai. Good evening. My name is Michelle Nikolai, and my address is on file. I'm a parent of a junior at Forest Park High School, an ESOL teacher at Carydale, and my daughter is currently in her sophomore year studying to be a teacher. I am very invested in our school system. I recently watched a presentation to the school board that outlined a proposal to spend $47.8 million 
on daylighting options at four high schools. I am well aware of the contentious feelings surrounding the architecture of the newer high school buildings as compared with the older buildings. However, this CIP expenditure of $47.8 million is not the answer. While I understand that funds for capital improvements are a separate funding stream from programs, at the end of the day, it is still funded by the county taxpayers. The manner in which the school board allocates the tax dollars speaks to what the school board values. Spending this massive amount of money to provide more daylight to approximately 25% of classrooms in four high schools should not be a priority. You may be thinking it's not a priority for you because your child doesn't attend one of the four schools impacted, but that's where you would be wrong. Inequity within and across our schools certainly exists. I've seen it as a parent, I've experienced it as a teacher, and I've heard about it in talking with parents through my community organizing. I want to see real, long-lasting change in our schools that brings an equal education to each and every one of our over 91,000 students. If you really care about equity within and across our schools, which I believe you do, then you will allocate tax dollars to areas that will truly make a difference in the culture of our schools. We need to hire and retain teachers for our vacant special education and ESOL teaching positions. We have some of our most vulnerable special education students being taught by substitute teachers. We need to hire more bilingual teachers to communicate with our newcomer students from Spanish-speaking countries. We need to hire more teachers of color so that the role models in the classroom look like the students they are teaching. I implore you to really dig deeper to find solutions to inequity within and across our schools. A $47.8 million project to bring more light in will not make significant change. Thank you. Melissa Roth. Melissa Roth. Good evening, and thank you for having me. My name is Melissa Roth, and my address is on file. As a parent of a student in Woodbridge Senior High School, I heard Mr. Walt's opening remarks last meeting regarding the investigation into the abrupt departure of head coach Gary Wortham Sr. However, I fear this delayed action is too late. Parents have relentlessly appeared before the board for months in outrage and concern for our children regarding the tactics deployed and direction given by Woodbridge Senior High School Athletic Director, Mr. Jason Eldridge. I have personal experience with Mr. Eldridge um, during a phone call on August 8, 2019 at 3 p.m. He called me in response to my concern with his abrupt leadership style. Now you've heard countless parents talk about this, so I'm not gonna go into the circumstance of what you already know. But what you don't know is during this call, he explained um, how he was hired to clean house. And those were the words used. And that, when further asked, he said, I will try to save the staff, which can only imply that the staff was meant to be removed. My experience during this hour and 15 minute conversation, I took notes and I was appalled. I could not believe me as a parent was exposed to the inner workings of why this coach was hired and what he's there to do now. It demonstrated to me an unmistakably clear indication of his inexperience managing a department of this size and his inexperience period as a head athletic coach. Who manages this way? Again, I'm a parent. I shouldn't have been in this conversation at all. Where was the leadership of Woodbridge Senior High School then? Prince William County had the most sought after coach in the county. Some would argue the state. And, and yet his abrupt departure didn't raise any eyebrows. Where was the investigation then? 
because I assure the board, we were there talking. We were not quiet. We are not quiet now, and we were not quiet then. This delay ha may have cost all of us the loss of a nationally recognized coach in our county. Prince William County has published school division culture, and it states, we believe in the commitment to our school division, to all of its employees. I ask you, are you sure you have fulfilled your commitment to Mr. Wortham and his staff? It also states, we believe in the effect of communication and public relations are the responsibility of every employee. I ask again, where was this belief when Thank Mr. You, Eldridge Roth. responded? Thank you. Time. Emmett Fletcher. Good evening. My name is Emmett Fletcher. My name is on file. We've been here for several months. But let me address Mr. Chairman, school board members, Dr. Waltz. It's, it's terrible that we have to keep coming back, but we'll come back as needed. We've been going through this. You know the facts. No action has been taken as we know of. So we're going to keep coming back and coming back until we get it right. We're not going anywhere. We will get it right. One of the things I remember about Woodbridge High School is produced some outstanding students and fine athletes. Russell Davis back in the 70s. Tony Lilly back in the 80s. These guys went on and played professional ball with Pittsburgh and Denver. And we have one of our own in my fraternity that was a state wrestler, wrestler uh, Eric Noel. He himself has gone to college, come back, and given to the community. The way it's going now, with the bad taste in the mouth of the kids, they don't, they don't want to come back probably. Why would you come back if you were mistreated at a school while you were a student? The parents feel mistreated. And so far, for the last three or four months, nothing has happened. And I don't, I don't get it. Why is it taking so long? I, I contact some of the school board members. They don't know. Then the last school board meeting, it was supposed to have been an investigation. It sounded like it was going to be an inside investigation. You can't investigate yourself. So we need to know what's going on, whether or not it's an outside investigation or, or what's going on. We don't know. And it's not fair to the parents. It is not fair. And they are frustrated. We have some of our church leaders here tonight, and they are frustrated. Members of the church are frustrated. Community members are frustrated. We have some newly elected board members. Please act on this. Do, do the right thing. Do the right thing. So far, I don't see justice. It's just us, OK? That's the way I feel. I think we have one of the greatest education systems in the country, but right now we are divided citizens in the county, and Woodbridge is out there on a limb by themselves. And what I hear from the parents, it's not fair, and you need to do something about it. Just like we told the last board members, we vote you in. As Reverend Ellis said, we'll vote you out. So don't think it's going to be an easy job coming up here and, and looking you know, nice every other Wednesday. It's not going to work. You got work to do. And we want you to do your job and do it right now. Brandon Holland. Brandon Holland. Good evening. My name is Dr. Brandon Holland, head athletic trainer at City Hilton High School. My address is 4839 Benicia Lane, Dumfries 22025. And I'm here to speak uh, not only on behalf of myself, but my colleagues, the athletic trainers in the, in the county uh, at the secondary uh, level, particularly high schools. Um, a lot of things have been changing with our uh, contracts and with our duties and responsibilities. I know a lot of work has been put in. Thank you, Dr. Waltz and also uh, Mr. Mulgrew and 
Kelly Gardner, we've had support from Mr. Bassett and lots of people in the room and beyond the room. If I don't remember your name, please charge it to my head and not my heart. Um, I just wanted to, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of confusion going on as to where we will be next year and what we'll be doing next year as far as our duties. Are we going back into the classroom, back to split duty? And um, we, we really don't know a lot uh, as to what the plans are. But I just wanted to share with you some, of the, some more details. Last time I was here to advocate on behalf of our students. This time I'm, I'm here to advocate on behalf of us. Um, things have changed and proved for us greatly uh, for those of us who have been able to go in to work and strictly be just clinicians and not teacher clinicians. And it's, it's a really difficult thing. Our caseloads are huge. Some of us will have upwards of 1,000 athletes in our program. And even beyond that, even our non-athletic population, if there's an injury that prevents their ability to perform in class, we also assist those people as well. And um, we do it day in and day out without assistance. We don't have assistant athletic trainers. We don't have people who work alongside us in our office to help us do their jobs. Um, so I think it's really important. And uh, when I got to Prince William County in 2006, I was impressed by the mantra that we provide a world-class education. It was something that was, I, I want, my goal is always to be my best. And a lot of times I'm working to be my best, I end up being the best. And that sounds arrogant, but a lot of us had that in us. Um, so my goal as an athletic trainer is to provide world-class healthcare to our kids. They deserve it. And um, we, we really can't do that if we, we have two things that we have to focus on. Um, because the duties for one always bleed over into the time where the duties for the other are supposed to begin and vice versa. Our, our hours really haven't changed now that we're not teaching. We're still coming in at 10 or 11 o'clock during the day. We still do a lot of work before the bell rings and we're still leaving at night at nine or 10 o'clock. So we're still working 50, 60 hours a week, some of us, um, most of us actually. So um, if we are to continue to be able to provide world-class care for our student athletes, um, we ask your help in protecting our duties and allowing us to focus on being clinicians and um, to not have our duties and responsibilities and attention divided to do two full-time jobs instead of one. So that's my time. I just wanted to say thank you again. Thank you. Dr. Kate Olson Flynn. I thought it was later on on the list. <laughs> um, good evening, Chairman Latif, school board members, and Dr. Waltz. I want to say first, welcome to all the school board members. Um, there's such promise in this new school board to do great things for the students and teachers of this county. Because this is a new board in the beginning of the budget season, I would like to suggest that this new board think about creating a mission and vision statement that provides the guiding principles that govern your work with the budget and school policies. The most important job that a school board undertakes is to govern how and to whom the county's money is allocated. If you truly value the ideas of equity and access for all students in all communities in this county, then those values should be made public and should steer your work with the budget and in all decisions you make. A mission statement helps you deliver that goal. And now with the administration, they do have a mission statement, but that mission statement doesn't address equity or access. For example, a world-class education in the administration means the focus is on all students learning and achieving at high level, high standards. Instruction is engaging and rigorous. Reading and writing literacy is taught in all content areas. We support the academic, social, and emotional needs of all students. Schools and offices are inviting, wel welcoming, and customer-oriented. Nowhere is providing equity, educational opportunities, or access for disadvantaged students mentioned in the administration's goals. Hoping to treat all students equally is not the same thing as delivering equity. Some communities need more resources, more time and attention because of poverty, language difference, historical marginalization, and discrimination. Words and actions matter. A close look at the administration's mission statement can illustrate one part of this oversight as equity as a goal for inviting, welcoming, customer-oriented oriented schools. For example, the Infrastructure Task Force made recommendations to the previous board to make changes in the CIP that would move up the timetable for the older schools in the county to be renovated, so to make every school meet your mission of being inviting, welcoming, and customer-oriented. 
and I believe that only one recommendation has been adopted, and that's to renovate Graham Park Middle, which is wonderful for them. There were many other recommendations that haven't been addressed that would help many schools with the most economically disadvantaged students to make their school environment inviting, welcoming, and customer-oriented. To deliver, then the task force recommendations should be adopted in the CIP and timetable and budget to meet equity goals. If equity is something that we all want as a county, then the mission and vision statements you need to write should reflect these words so that all star stakeholders are held accountable because words and actions matter. And I look forward to hearing your statements. Elizabeth Johnson. Hi, um, my name is Elizabeth Johnson and I'm a senior at Patriot High School. Um, I have students from Battlefield and Patriot High School behind me as long as uh, Tiziana Botino supporting me. Um, I thank you for your time. Uh, thank you members of the school board and Superintendent Waltz for allowing me to speak today. I appreciate your time. We are at the crossroads of a new decade. Do we continue with the status quo or do we start a journey of sustainability and progress in this new decade? Climate change threatens the entire human race. We have very little time left to cut back on greenhouse gas emissions. We as young people are worried about what our futures will look like. We desperately need change and we need it now, not in 10 or 20 years. We need to do our tiny individual part in Prince William County and hold ourselves accountable for the emissions that we are creating. By increasing energy efficiency and transitioning to renewable energy, the school system will save money in the long run. Discovery Elementary in Arlington, the first net zero school in Virginia, produced more energy than it used, and now Discovery saves 11, uh, 11, $117,000 $100, per year in utility costs. Just, add, just adding energy efficiency me measures can reduce emissions by 30% or more. Now I'm going to go over my asks. The climate crisis and reducing emissions must be included in PWCS's future plans and net zero goals. The, uh, we would like for the four-year strategic plan to include increasing energy efficiency and net zero goals. Additionally, the capital improvements plan or CIP must include a transitioning to clean energy and increasing energy efficiency. We need solar on our schools. We need better energy efficiency. We need new school blueprints to be net zero and we need electric school buses. These goals are achievable and are the bare minimum of what we need to do to combat the climate crisis. I also ask that you release a request for information and a request for proposal for electric school buses like Fairfax County did so that companies and individuals can start sending information and proposals on the buses. I suggest that the Student Senate uh, uh, create a environmental and sustainability committee as well. Um, staff members that have been around here longer than the school board members. You need to be doing your part as well in this fight to transition to net zero energy. Not only the school board members, but also staff are needed to commit to sustainability and carbon neutrality as well. Uh, we ask that you do your part in this clean energy journey. School board members, establishing a staff sustainability task force is not enough either. School board members and staff need to work together in unison to achieve sustainability goals. We need you to step up and do your part. Thank you. Tiziana Botino. Good evening, board members. My name is Tiziana Botino. I live in the Occoquan District. My address is on file. First, I want to say congratulations to newly elected board members. Um, and, uh, we f and also to those of you that were re-elected, uh, we feel a lot of hope uh, for things to come, thanks to, to, to you. Uh, I'm a concerned mother and a community organizer with Mothers Up Front. I'm here today standing in solidarity with this incredible group of students to ask you to take swift action on the greatest existential threat of our lives, climate change. It may not seem like schools have a stake in fighting the climate crisis, but if you consider it nationwide, schools produce as much greenhouse gas emission as 18 coal power plants and 15 million cars, and that school buses are the largest mass transit system in the country with half, uh, almost half a million uh, buses. Uh, one can see that that's simply not true. 
The General Assembly just passed in the House of Delegates a resolution declaring a climate emergency in Virginia, and other counties such as Fairfax and Arlington have plans in place to mitigate the climate crisis starting in schools. Our question is, what are you waiting for? What is stopping you from taking action? Today, I stand in solidarity um, uh, with the students to ask you for very concrete action. Specifically, we'd like for you to invest in a new school prototype to make every new school fossil-free or net zero and to eventually begin retrofitting our existing schools. Uh, we also ask that you include net zero schools and sustainability as a top priority in your strategy plan and CIP. It's easy to say we cannot do it, uh, it's too difficult or costly, but how can such statements be made without even researching it? If youth feel scared and anxious for their future to the point of having to come out and plead with you, you know something is seriously wrong. We are the adults, and we are the ones that are supposed to make our children feel safe. But if they are here to speak up for themselves, it means we're not doing a good enough job. LED light bulbs, more windows are a good start, but not good enough to seriously deal with the climate crisis at hand. And when it comes to climate change, a slow victory is still a loss. Thank you. Catherine Stark. Catherine Stark. Good evening, my name is Catherine Stark and my address is on file. Thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to talk to you this evening and provide my input into a situation that I feel needs focus and commitment. I am here this evening to strongly urge you to make Dick Zero Schools a top priority and a key focus. I am a mother of two children and it's for this reason that I find it my responsibility to be an active participant in addressing the climate crisis. As elected officials, I believe you have the same responsibility. People may see a school board as responsible for allocating resources linked to education, like direct spend on books and paying teachers, better wages to attract high caliber candidates. While I agree these are important components, I feel that in the short, it's a short term view and one that may be irrelevant as we move into territories that are unknown and risks that we do not, we do not know we're going to face. Risks that pose and to undermine many of the gains we have made or plans to make in childhood development. As we know from scientific data, the climate crisis is real, and the time for action is now. If young generations of today stand any chance in a future that is comparable to the standards that we afford ourselves today, we need to start implement, implementing drastic changes immediately. There, there are no greater growing threats facing world's children and their children than the climate crisis. Some consequences that we are already having to cope with are summer heat waves that restrict children's ability to play outside, increase um, health threats, and cause school closures. Threats of fire, which we've seen in California resulting in school closures due to electricity being cut off, that also increase air pollution, water short shortages, and floods. In, North, in the North American continent, a staggering four, 530 million children live in extremely high flood occurrence zones. In the 2019 report, uh, the, the Lancet Count on Health and Climate Change cited the following disturbing facts. There are mental health issues happening as a result of fires and floods with the frequency and intensity that children now have to face. A child born today will live until around 2019. Without changes to greenhouse gases, the planet could warm by four degrees centigrade. And we do not know the catastrophic health effects that this could have. We are seeing a rise in concern for, from the youth around the world and in the United States. This may be the first time in history that the United States and the children in it wonder if they are going to have a future and if the land of opportunity still exists for them. Um, in the report, the UNICEF said that the world does now need to cut down greenhouse gases um, dramatically. The time to, choose, to act is now. I hope that the school board will remember the climate will be remembered for climate leadership and not for enabling the climate crisis. Thank you. Swanell Wiggins. Hello, thank you once again for having me. My name is Swanell Wiggins and my address is on file. 
racially undertone written messages to predominantly, a predominantly minority football team. Racially undertone spoken response to a student of Bolivian descent. FERPA violations. Why should our children be subjected to unethical and immoral behavior? Damaged emotions, plunging grades, feelings of mistrust. Most recently, reports have come in that students are being harassed by teachers. Isn't there a zero tolerance bullying policy in Prince William County schools, or does that only apply to students? Parents have complained to building administration, the superintendent and his staff, and the board for three months to no avail. Dr. Walls, why is it so hard for you to take action to help our children have a world-class education in which you speak? Although an outside law firm has been hired to investigate our complaints, it seems that outside only means that the firm is not housed in this building. Isn't this the same law firm that has, been, has a relationship with the school board for years? Does saying that the firm is outside mean that there doesn't appear to be a conflict of interest? It feels as though those who made the complaints are being investigated instead of the one the complaints are waged against. Our written official complaints were detailed enough for you to investigate immediately and thoroughly. How long will we have to wait for you, Dr. Waltz, to do what is just for our children? Or is it that they live in a different part of the county and they have more pigment in their skin? Why is this behavior being rewarded instead of condemned? By not taking a stance against the claims of racial injustice implies that you condone the actions of the director of student activities at Woodbridge Senior High School. Should there be an additional complaint filed? Board, we encourage you to stand with the parents in our fight for justice and equity for our children. We ask that the policies, regulations, and state codes that have been put in place to protect our babies are adhered to. We want justice. No. We demand justice, and we demand it now. Thank you. Cozy Bailey. Good evening, my name is Cozy Bailey and my address is on file. Go back to where you came from. It was that phrase coming from the mouth of one of your employees, Dr. Waltz, that became a lightning rod for members of this, of this community as indicated by the number of people who are here tonight. Jason Eldridge told the coaches and the students at Woodbridge Senior High that he had a mandate to clean up the program and that the players could go back to where they came from if they didn't like it. I and others have addressed the racism inherent in the use of this phrase, but our pleas and our demands for appropriate action have resulted in very little, and this inaction is just as unacceptable as the offensive language. Dr. Walsh, you and I have had several conversations and discussions on how to improve the educational experience of the students of Prince William County. During those conversations, you always came across as caring and compassionate. But most importantly, you came across as respectful, if not necessarily understanding, of the issues of concern to African-American parents and students. But on this issue, your recalcitrance and reticence to respond to the concerns of the parents and students, coupled with this inane investigation that you chartered, leads us to believe that you think we're stupid. You must think that we're stupid when you declare in a reality TV worthy performance that you're commissioning an investigation using outside counsel. When the law firm you use has represented Prince William County Schools for years and you expect that we'll accept their findings as fair and impartial. You must think that we're stupid and can't discern that an orchestrated cover up is underway. 
and your so-called investigator must think that these parents are stupid enough to give any verbal statements to him when they have filed official and legal and written complaints. You must think that we're stupid and will continue to come to these chambers and speak only of this demeaning and destructive incident. You must think that we're too stupid to recognize that this is just the tip of the iceberg of previously well-hidden and camouflaged feelings of indifference and insensitivity. Well, let me tell you, we're not stupid. We do know that your slow action to address this situation is based on your priority of protecting a white probationary employee over the need to provide for the educational well-being of these students of color. We're not stupid. We do know that some of your staff find it hard to believe that a black man, Coach Gary Wortham, can have the success that he's had on the field and in the lives of these young people without cheating. And then you try to intimidate him to be a part of the charade of an investigation. You know what? But we are stupid enough to believe that we will prevail. We're going to keep on coming until justice and equity are achieved. And we're going to use whatever means at our disposal to get what we and our children as residents of this Thank county, you, this commonwealth, and this country deserve Thank you, simply Mr. because of our humanity. Thank you very much. Alice Crow. Well, all I can say is that is a hard act to follow, but I'll give it a try. Um, no, I am completely in solidarity with you. Uh, my name is Alice Crow. I'm an environmental attorney, a member of the Greater Prince William Climate Action Network and Mothers Out Front. I am here to speak in favor of fossil-free net zero schools. This is my third time speaking on this topic. And as the gentleman said earlier, we will keep coming back and coming back and coming back until the board completely evaluates this issue and gives it the time that it, that it deserves. I hope you listen very carefully to the students that were speaking earlier because it is their future that is in jeopardy. They are the ones that will face the brunt of the climate impacts to come and they will continue to deal with debilitating climate anxiety because we adults are not doing our job. Climate change is one of the most important issues facing humans today, and we have very little time left to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Without a planet, we can't live, and we certainly can't educate. And as we all know, there is no planet B. Therefore, in my mind, continuing to build and maintain schools that burn fossil fuels is irresponsible and short-sighted. Schools can entirely offset their climate impacts with a commitment to 100% clean energy. We have previously asked the school board to please take the tour of the Discovery School in Arlington. It was built under budget. It produces way more energy than it uses. And as said, it now saves at least over $100,000 per year in utility cost, enough to cover the salaries of two more teachers. As far as I know, no member of the school board has taken that tour. And yes, we all have day jobs. If you cannot make the tour, there is another alternative that we are suggesting to you, and that is that Kathy Lynn, the energy manager of the Arlington Discovery School, can come to this board and give you a presentation and answer any questions that you might have about the construction of the school, the sustainability of the school, the cost of the school, how it operates, how the children are so engaged with their own production, production of their own energy, how it excites them and makes them proud and makes them feel that there is hope for the future despite Thank you, Ms. Crow. climate change. Thank you. Richard Jesse. <clears throat> Good 
My name is Richard Jesse. My address is on file. Good evening, Dr. Latif, Dr. Waltz. I don't have a lot to say tonight because most of it's been said. There's a, a, a trend going on, and this board, the new members, uh, condolences, but you know, you came into this in mid season. This started back, the Woodbridge High School issue started back in August, and it's still going on. You now have climate uh, issues, and these people are going on. By the way, stand up for a second. This is an elected official. I think she's a member of the Salt and Water. Yeah, so she does know what she's talking about, and she does uh, represent the Prince William County. But keep in mind that these folks are serious. We do not feel that they are being given a fair shake, and we want you to investigate, but we want you to investigate with a firm that is not associated with the school system. We think that is fair, that is just, and that needs to be done. For some reason, I think the board has to understand, and I've said this, I think, several times, that there is a conflict not that Ms. McGowan is bad, but there is a conflict when the division council and the school board council are the same people. When there is an issue affecting both people, you can't have the same council on it. And uh, I think we need to address that, and we need to address the issue. Having an investigation, but with a different firm, I think is important. Thank you. Aurora Hurtado. Good evening, I'm Aurora Hurtado. My address is on record. And tonight I want to talk about the school boundary process. Um, I really hesitated before signing up because I didn't want to distract from the very important messages from the Woodbridge uh, High School community. As I've said it before, I'm just a mom with a preschooler and a kid in elementary school. We are fortunate to be zoned to an extraordinary elementary, but I'm here today because I hope that by the time they go to high school, we won't have to worry about the equity issues that our community is facing today. So thank you to the parents that are standing up for what they think is fair and right for their children. So hopefully those of us coming behind you won't have to face the same issues. Thank you. Um, back to boundaries, the recent boundary processes in Prince William County show that there is much need and opportunity for improvement. Uh, in speaking with several members of our community, there were some suggestions or requests that we have for a more effective process. Number one, the school board members should have um, the opportunity to provide their input prior to having plans presented to the community. We, the voters, elected you to make decisions on our behalf. We did not elect a volunteer community committee. We elected you. Um, the volunteer community or committee uh, will play a role on the boundaries, but they need to be more representative of the impacted population. I think during the elementary uh, school boundary process, the Westridge representative even didn't have children in the school system. Uh, you had 16 elementary schools impacted with only 15 spots for volunteers. So maybe have a process that includes two volunteers per school, or maybe base the number of volunteers on the number of students and families impacted in every school. Please work with the planning uh, to make sure that the uh, planning division really takes into account the suggestions from the committee rather, rather than limiting them or telling them what they should be doing. Um, some suggestions presented by the planning committee in the elementary process were dismissed by planning only to have similar proposals when the school board presented uh, their plans. That shows that volunteers could understand the dynamics of their communities in a way that someone who sits in an office cannot. Please do not put families through these processes during the holidays. Many Christmases and Thanksgivings were ruined during the elementary school process. Be creative. Do we need to build a 14th high school that's going to cost over $160 million, or should we invest in reno renovating and adding capacity to our existing high schools? Um, I think I'm going to run out of time. This is going to be an ongoing conversation. I will send you my comments, and thank you. 
Madiha Najum. Hello, um, good evening. Uh, thank you for your time. My name is Madia Najam and my address is on file. Um, I'm currently a senior at Patriot High School and from a young age, I've always been interested in the role that I could play to keep my environment happy, clean, and healthy. And I remember joining my school's environmental conservation organization, or Eco Club for short, in freshman year in order to make an observable difference around my school. And currently, I'm a co-president. Our student-led organization is amazing. We've achieved so much through our uh, genuine love for bettering the school's community. However, it's really not enough. I shouldn't, as a student, be right here demanding change from you guys. Uh, the school board has the ability to make a significant positive difference for the whole Prince William County, a difference that we as students can with our limited time and resources. So why aren't you doing this of your own accord? Dr. Waltz, you attended the opening of Patriots Outdoor Classroom, and you mentioned that we were young activists. This is true. We are young activists, and we're doing all we can. We need you guys to do all you can, too. We need to retrofit existing schools and update the plans for future schools to become net zero, and do that soon. Not only does this benefit our environment, but it also saves money to be allocated towards teacher salaries, hiring new staff, or anything else that improves the quality of our education, which in turn uh, increases the value of your Prince William County School and providing a world-class education. It's going to be a lot of work, but it is more than possible. And you have the support of all the students here, including mothers out front. And um, this isn't written, but after listening to other people's concerns, it was really upsetting um, to see all of the, the inequity in this county. And this change should not just be for you know, the newer schools or different sections of the county. This has to be implemented throughout the whole county, regardless of where you're from, your zip code, your area. It doesn't matter because we all are students of this county um, and we need to work together to really make a difference that will really last in the future. Thank you for your time. Natasha Gillespie. Hi, my name is Natasha Gillespie. My address is on file. I don't have anything written down. I'm just going to piggyback what I done heard. Now, we done been up here since August, as you know. You done heard it about four or five times tonight. But why is it we, you done heard that this man has violated FERPA? He has um, stated that he came to clean house. Um, the co-coaching staff has resigned, and you still don't see any urgency. I understand that last, what, last meeting, you stated that there was going to be um, outside investigation. Not comfortable with that. There's a credibility. We deserve more. Our children deserve more. We're not getting anything from you. There's no way that Mr. Elbridge should still be an active um, teacher at Woodbridge while all of this is going against him. This is nothing per se. This is something that is proven. This, we, we have put this on document, on, a, on an official form, and yet nothing is happening. We don't have to keep coming up telling you all that we're going to vote you out when you come in, because that's going to happen if you don't, don't look, look, help us out. But that should not, we should not have to put that in place. That shouldn't be a threat or nothing. That, that shouldn't have to be in place. You should do what's right, because you was elected to do what's right. You was elected to help these children, look out for these children. Mr. Wall, I had great respect for you. The kids, um, when you were doing that code red and all that, and they were looking for your tweets and admiring your tweets and wanting to respond to your tweets, what's a tweet when you're not being responsible to their needs? There's a difference. I, as a mother, you know, my son should be worried about going to class. You know, he playing, he want to play ball. He's not even interested in 
plan for WordPress no more. You all allow him, that to be taken away from him. Because nobody, you think that football, what is football? Football keep kids out of trouble. Football give people hope that didn't have hope. You know, we even hear the, the people uh, talking about the demographic of fossil and, and, and wanting to give them um, different people who, who's not in a income bracket the same, re the same responsibility, the same things uh, as far as having clean air. Why, why do we have to beg for that? Because you're in a lower income bracket or you live in a certain zip code, but it's easier for other people. You all are setting a pattern, and the pattern is the perception of you don't even care about us, and that's a shame. Godwana Gaskins. Good evening, my name is Tawana Gaskins and my address is on file. I have two issues regarding discrimination against my granddaughter, Tanaja Gaskins, and her, this school is Patriots High School. Um, the first incident was with Ms. Wilson, the art teacher. The class was taking pictures of the students. They had a dark backdrop. When it was time for my granddaughter and two other black students to take their pictures, the teacher told them that they could not take a picture in front of the dark backdrop because they were too dark and they would not have a good picture. So she made them take stand in front of a white backdrop so their pictures could come out better. And this is the second incident um, that happened at Patrick High School. Uh, my granddaughter was made to read a book called Of Men and Mice. Um, Miss Coyle, the English teacher, um, had them read the book in its entirety and watch the movie. The N-word was used numerous of times in this movie. Um, my granddaughter asked the assistant teacher, Mr. Mann, why were they watching a movie that had people saying the N-word? And his response was, you guys say it to each other all the time, so why worry about it being said now? I called the school and I spoke to uh, Ms. Locus and informed her about the movie. I was told by Ms. Locus that she knew nothing about that movie being shown in this, shown to the students in the English, in the English class. The teacher did not have permission to show this movie without her consent or the permission of the parents. Um, so Ms. Lucas stated that she would investigate and send out letters to apologize to the parents that the movie was in question and did not have permission or consent to be shown. I have never, I haven't heard from the, the teacher, Ms. Lucas, nor anybody else regarding these two incidents that has taken place at Patrick's High School. Um, and I would like some actions taken um, and for someone to get back to me as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. Sana Warsi. Um, good evening, my name is Sana Warsi. I'm a junior at Patriot High School. I would like to congratulate the new, newly elected board members and I appreciate being given the chance to speak about net zero schools and its benefits for the environment. One of the most overwhelming problems regarding our lives is the safety of the environment and the protection of our atmosphere. One of the largest issues discussed today is climate change. According to the United Nations Emissions Gap Report 2018, there's only 10 years left to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is, this is a reason why we should be strategic and act fast before it's too late. A step towards reducing greenhouse emissions is reducing our usage of fossil fuel. Burning fossil fuels pollutes the environment and ultimately harms my health and future. But what world will my generation live in if it's completely deteriorated by the generations that preceded them? 
Other countries have already been devastated by climate change and pollution, one of them being Pakistan, my father's home country. I've experienced firsthand pollution and climate change, seen its negative effects. The amount of sand along with pollution that was in the air was so visibly noticeable that we barely got time, got to spend time outside, as children normally do in America. According to the Sustainable Development Policy Institute, or SDPI, the leading cause for pollution in Pakistan include vehicle emissions and industrial emissions. The things that I witnessed there are things I hope that America, especially PWCS, will be able to avoid. Starting with schools, we should implement the idea of net zero schools. According to the US Department of Energy, zero energy schools can use between 65% to 80% less energy than conventionally constructed, constructed schools, and the remaining energy required is supplied by renewable energy, a resource that's price is decreasing. I ask that you commit to invest in new school ID, in new school plans for net zero buildings and retrofit existing schools to be net zero ready to the best of your ability. Another, another demand I would like to make is to put out a request for information for school buses by 2030. Make the better decision for our community and for our future students. Make a better, safer, cleaner place for us students to learn in. Thank you. Barry Wells. Good evening. My name is Barry Wells, and my address is on file. On August 15th, in a meeting between members of the football staff at Woodbridge High School, Heather Abney, Jason Eldridge, Chris Beamer, Jason Eldridge stated explicitly that he was hired to clean house and get rid of the football coaching staff, claiming that community-wide and within the Prince William County school system, there's a negative perception and poor reputation regarding the Woodbridge football program. It is quite interesting that nothing of this sort was ever presented to the coaching staff prior to Eldridge's arrival. Heather Abney demonstrated her lack of management expertise as she was unable to effectively manage Jason Eldridge's transition into his new role. Understanding that he was a first time DSA should have warranted proper oversight guide, and guidance on her part, which she failed miserably to provide. Consider also that prior to Eldridge's arrival, she was actively engaged with the football program and staff by way of social media, Rebel Run Sports interviews, was also highly visible before, during, and after football games. This speaks volumes with regard to the success that the football program enjoyed for four years without incident. During that same August 15th meeting, Heather Abney promised to be more supportive of the football staff and program. As it turns out, the promise was empty, and she stood by silently while her new DSA attacked and dismantled the credibility of the football staff and program. What is most amazing here is that this was not a hidden agenda. Jason Eldridge and Heather Abney's presence and the presence of several football coaches made clear that the direction from their leadership was to dispense with the head coach and his staff. As we all know, once you become a leader, leadership is not optional. It's your job to lead, not be led. Heather Abney chose to let her incapable subordinate run amok, which is precisely why we are here again today. I'd like to close with a quote by John F. Kennedy. Every time we turn our heads the other way, when we see law flouted, when we tolerate what we know to be wrong, when we close our eyes and ears to the corrupt because we are too busy or too frightened, when we fail to speak up and speak out, we strike a blow against freedom decency, and justice. Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to superintendent's time. At this point, we will be um, the presentation of the fiscal year 2021 proposed budget and capital improvement plan. Dr. Waltz, sorry. Thank you, Chairman Latif and members of the board. Good evening. This evening, I will be presenting my budget proposal for the upcoming fiscal year. 
First, I want to thank our teachers, administrators, support staff, parents, community, and school board for their support and great successes we have achieved this year and for the past 15 years as I have served as superintendent. Among the achievements we have accomplished together and I am most proud of during my time as superintendent, they include an on-time graduation rate that continues to rise to a high now of 92.4%. That's nearly 10 percentage points over where we were a decade ago and exceeds our neighbors in Fairfax County and Montgomery County. The implementation of full day kindergarten and division wide pre-K expansions. These are critical to placing our students on an early path toward success. High achievement in academic success, including 100% of our schools receiving full state accreditation and high growth in our career and technical education certifications. Opening 24 new schools and 36 additions on time and within budget. It is also worth noting the significant changes that Prince William County Schools has undergone over the past 15 years. Our enrollment has increased from 65,000 to a projected enrollment of 92,000, an increase of 40%. Enrollment of English language learners has increased from 4,900 to nearly 15,000, an increase of 300%, while at the same time we achieved double-digit increases in our math SOL scores for EL students last year. Our students who qualify as economically disadvantaged have increased from 15,000 to more than 37,000, an increase of 250%. We also lowered class size during this time and did not lay off a single employee during the Great Recession, unlike nearly every other school division locally and nationally. However, for all these numbers, there is one statistic that has not changed in my 15 years. In 2005, we were second to the last in the Washington, D.C. metro region in per-pupil funding, just ahead of Prince George's County, Maryland. And 15 years later, we remain second to the last, now just ahead of Manassas Park. PWCS also falls below the national per-pupil spending average. If funded on a per-pupil basis at the rates of nearby school divisions, which we are often compared to and expected to achieve at the same level, PWCS would receive additional annual revenue of approximately $260 million a year if funded similar to Loudoun, $294 million yearly if funded similarly to Fairfax, and $736 million yearly if funded similarly to Arlington, that's the school district with the Discovery School. This is not acceptable. Our students, teachers, and families deserve better. So tonight I am proposing a true needs-based budget, as is my responsibility under the state code. As the great Martin Luther King Jr. said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. And so I can no longer wait for change to happen with the hope our children receive the necessary support. I must advocate for them every year in a child's education is irreplaceable. Let me share a bit more about our changing needs. As many of you know, in the past year, I began to engage on Twitter. And of course, much of the visibility came from snow days originally. However, it has gone well beyond that. It has provided the opportunity to engage firsthand with thousands of students, parents, and staff. Let me give you a few real examples. I'm not going to include their names, but the stories are true. I heard from a Forest Park High School student who was so stressed by her myriad of responsibilities supporting her family that she was not sure she would graduate. Her counselor was able to give her the help she needed a Garfield High School student who wasn't sure he could afford to go to college. I was able to encourage and support him, and he went on to get a scholarship to Cornell this year. A middle schooler who was having thoughts of self-harm, that we were able to get the support they needed immediately. 
an elementary teacher who was so proud to show me how she is using technology to help her English language learner students connect and engage with each other and the curriculum. A parent who shared that our pre-K program helped their student graduate on time, go to college, and get a highly successful job. It is for these students and staff and thousands of others like them that tonight I propose a budget that does the following. Supports our teachers, equips our students equitably with the tools necessary to succeed in school, college, and careers, and provides additional resources to provide the critical wraparound services critical to student well-being. However, our budget this year faces a number of challenges. First, we do not expect any support for teacher pay increases from the state in this year's budget, resulting in a salary gap of nearly $9 million. Second, we anticipate an increased enrollment of approximately 1,000 students next year, a cost of $17 million. Third, we are opening two new schools in September of 2021, and the associated costs next fiscal year to start preparing, including additional staffing, are expected to be approximately $3 million. Fourth, the state has cut funding for the regional school for special education by approximately $14 million total to PWCS, with a $3 million impact this next fiscal year, and further cuts in 2022. Fifth, the state is increasing our Virginia retirement system expense by $6.2 million. Lastly, we made a number of significant investments last year that we plan to maintain, including the hiring of 55 counselors and fully funding the findings of our special education audit recommendations. Recognizing our fiscal limitations and our significant needs, my needs-based budget proposal this evening focuses on six major priorities. Our core business is student success, and my top budget priority is educational equity and academic achievement. To assist schools in their efforts, I am proposing an increase in economically disadvantaged funding of more than $5.5 million. This budget proposal also includes more than $2.1 million for sustaining our class size reduction efforts, which we have successfully been reducing over the past five years. Looking at what we do through an equity lens, during the current year, we initiated the work of the Superintendent's Advisory Council on equity. And because equity is an action word, I am proposing the creation of a chief equity officer who can lead and coordinate our efforts division-wide to close gaps in access and opportunity for students and staff. I am also adding a Title IX officer to ensure compliance in this key area. Title IX is the law that protects people from discrimination based on sex and educational programs or activities that receive federal financial assistance. Academic preparation and access are critical to closing equity gaps, so I have included more than $1.2 million in funding to provide free fees at, or fee-free access to our virtual high school program. Also, the SAT remains a barrier for some students with college aspirations, and SAT preparation can be a cost out of reach for many students. So I'm proposing funding for the creation of a division-wide SAT preparation program for all students. Perhaps one of the most critical ways that we can help close gaps, set our students, and set them up for success is to equip them with learning and the tools necessary to succeed in a digital economy. This includes a focus on developing the five C's profile of Virginia graduate skills, critical thinking, creative thinking, collaboration, communication, and citizenship. No matter the path our students pursue, college, career, or military, it is imperative that they have these knowledge, skills, and abilities. Tonight, I propose the first of a multi-year investment to achieve digital equity within the next four years across every one of our schools. This effort will equip every student with a learning device assigned to them for the school year, along with the necessary professional development for our teachers. This will enable our teachers to enhance differentiated learning, enable students to engage in new and creative methods of learning, and to accelerate learning. 
This will also offset investments at the local school level, allowing schools to meet many other locally determined student, teacher, and school needs. Another key investment we will make in equity and in closing our achievement gaps is support for our students receiving special education services. Beyond sustaining the investments we made last year in special education that will continue, tonight I propose we hire 50 special education teaching assistants full-time and with benefits. We also know that the key to closing gaps in student success is parent and guardian engagement. To assist in this effort, I am proposing to staff our Parent Resource Center full-time to provide improved outreach regarding the many resources we have for our parents and guardians. Of course, our top priority cannot be achieved without outstanding teachers and staff. And my second priority in this budget is to support our teachers and staff who are at the heart of our success. I am pleased tonight to propose a step increase for all eligible employees in addition to a cost of living increase. This will total an average of nearly 4.8% increase in pay for employees. This is the same increase we were able to provide this school year. Additionally, while health care costs have increased nationally this year by 5%, I am proud to announce that my budget proposal includes no increase in employee health care costs for the second year in a row. My third budget priority is pre-kindergarten access that directly relates to equity and achievement. Tonight, I propose a significant investment in our pre-K programs, an increase of nearly $5 million to nearly double our total pre-K classrooms to a total of 49. This will bring more of our Prince William tax dollars back to the county through an increased use of available state matching dollars. My fourth priority is student mental health and wellness. This budget increases our wraparound support in a number of ways. As I stated earlier, this budget proposal sustains our new $5 million investment in counselors made for the current school year. I am also proposing the hiring of a 11 additional social workers, a total investment of more than 1.1 million. We know this is a critical resource for our schools and our families. Additionally, I am proposing a full-time psychologist shared between our global welcome centers. This key resource will ensure we are making and meeting children's needs from the moment they arrive in PWCS. The fifth priority within my budget proposal is career, military, and college readiness. Beyond our traditional academic program, it is critical that we fund career and technical education programs that provide the 21st century skills necessary to thrive in the digital economy. This budget will continue the investments in our five-year CTE plan, including the creation of a new culinary program at Garfield High School, and the first classes in firefighting ever at Osborne Park and Stonewall Jackson High Schools. Stonewall will also begin aviation maintenance. Woodbridge High School will launch Project Lead the Way Software Engineering, and Freedom High School will start medical coding and billing. These are among other career and junior ROTC programs found at our high schools. To support our students on the college track, I believe we need an expansion of our dual enrollment course offerings. The budget includes a dual enrollment incentive stipend to teach dual enrollment and tuition reimbursement to entice more teachers into this field. I am also proposing creation of a position responsible for identifying underrepresented students and increasing their access and opportunities for dual enrollment, AP, IB, and Cambridge offerings. My sixth priority is around sustainable facilities, school safety, and support infrastructure. This investment starts with a pursuit for equity in our older schools and funding outlined in our capital improvements program. This includes proposed additional natural light and windows through fenestration projects at Woodbridge, Garfield, Osborne Park, and Stonewall Jackson High Schools. It also includes security upgrades for Woodbridge and Grand Park Middle Schools. Included in this proposal is $4.1 million for Brentsville District High School stadium improvements. Our CIP also proposes funding for lighting for high school tennis courts. I am also proposing the funding needed for a study 
to determine how we might best proceed in making our schools more sustainable. Additionally, we must continue to make investments in our support infrastructure, and this budget includes the initial work necessary to upgrade our legacy financial and human resource information technology systems. As I stated at the beginning of my remarks, the work of teachers, administrators, and staff to deliver a world-class education without world-class funding is remarkable. Now is the time to make the investments in our children, our teachers, our schools, and our community. We cannot wait another year. As I challenged our school board previously, I ask our board to be advocates for our children, our teachers, and our families, and join me in seeking the full funding of our needs-based budget. The next 10 days are critical, and I believe this should be the top priority for this board during those 10 days. Together, we will make a significant positive impact on the ability for every child to succeed and thrive and every teacher, administrator, and support staff to feel supported and appreciated. I am as enthusiastic as I have ever been in my entire educational career and in my 15 years here in PWCS. Anyone who spends time with our students in our schools can only walk away energized and excited for the future. I am committed to being their advocate. I want to thank our partners at the County Board of Supervisors who have expressed their support for our students and teachers and in fact just yesterday passed a resolution supporting Red for Ed and designated education funding as a priority for the Prince William County fiscal year 2021 budget. I thank the school board as well for your continued support and partnership as we work together to ensure every one of our more than 92,000 students in Prince William County has a world-class education. I am now pleased to introduce Mr. John Wallingford, our Associate Superintendent for Finance and Risk Management, who will provide a few more highlights and additional detail on the numbers. Mr. Wallingford. Thank you, Superintendent Dr. Waltz. Uh, and Mr. As Mr. Wallingford approaches the, uh, uh, the podium, I just to remind board members, typically at this meeting we have uh, Mr. Wallingford and Superintendent Dr. Waltz um, um, give us an overview on the proposed budget. You will then, over the next few days, directly send your questions to Mr. Wallingford, the Associate Superintendent for Finance and Risk Management. He'll coordinate responses. We have our first meeting on Monday evening with the public for the public to come and um, in a similar way, we do citizens' time to come and address the board regarding budgetary concerns. Uh, Mr. Wallingford, and, and that, and I'll repeat this after your presentation, but our public meeting is going to be um, Monday, February 10th at 7 p.m., held here in the school board meeting room. And any individuals wishing to wish the address can um, notify the board clerk by phone, 703-791-8709, or by email at pwcsclerk at pwcs.edu prior to noon on the day of the board meeting and will be placed in the list of speakers. Individuals can also sign up at the school board meeting room prior to 6.55 p.m. on Monday night. And please remember the speakers will be uh, limited to three minutes just like we do now. Mr. Wallingford, please take it away. Dr. Latif, thank you. Dr. Latif, members of the board, Dr. Waltz, good evening. Tonight, I will highlight some of the key areas of the superintendent's budget proposal as well as providing some context to the budget conversations that you'll be having uh, and will be taking place over the next several months. I won't go into these budgets line by line. Uh, that de uh, detail will be provided to you in our executive summary and some documents that will be um, shared with you after, uh, after my presentation. I would encourage you, particularly the, the new board members, to read through this document thoroughly it provides a lot of information um, and the detail that you'll be looking for on pages 25 through 27 and pages 30 through 31. As you may be aware, uh, Virginia Code section 22.1-92 requires the superintendent to develop a proposed budget which meets the needs of the school division. Um, that budget the superintendent has shared with you this evening. After this evening, the school board, you, will review, revise, approve, and submit that resulting budget to the county. The Board of County Supervisors will then consider your submission and approve a budget for the school division. 
A couple of reminders before I uh, continue on. The Board of County Supervisors is responsible for funding the school division uh, upon request of the school board. They're responsible for setting tax rates and the Board of County Supervisors, the BOCS, does not have line item of authority over our budgets. They may only approve budgets at the lump sum level or in categories that are defined uh, by the state of Virginia. So here we go. A couple of budget highlights, high level. The operating budget this year is $1.24 billion, which is an increase over the current year's budget, the fiscal 20 budget, of just over $103 million, or 9.1%. Um, this budget's based on a projected enrollment of 92,048 students. And as Dr. Waltz went through in his presentation, uh, there's funding for each of his six priorities. Um, in a departure from our historical practice of adhering to the revenue sharing agreement, you can see here this last bullet, um, the superintendent is proposing a budget that exceeds that mark by $31.5 million this year. That's, uh, like I said, a departure, from, uh, a departure from our prior practices. So enrollment trends, a couple of numbers to uh, take a look at and consider as we move on. Uh, our uh, division-wide enrollment is increasing at roughly 1% per year right now. Um, we expect that to slow a bit, um, ranging anywhere between uh, 0.7 and 0.3% over the next five years. Um, of note, in the second slide, you see on uh, uh, our student enrollment for th uh, three categories, free and reduced, um, special education, and in English language learners over the past five years is increasing. Um, we continue to see significant growth in these areas, and these students require more support and therefore uh, enhanced uh, levels of funding. This slide tells, actually has two stories on it. The first, the two lines at the very bottom, the blue and the red, they represent our per pupil amounts, our per pupil expenditures over the period 2009 through 2021. And you can see they run from about 10,700 to just under $13,500 this year. Um, a point I wanna make, that 13,500 includes an additional $31.5 million that um, we're requesting in excess of the 57.23 revenue share. You can see that we're just, the red line to the bottom, you can see that we're just this year exceeding um, per pupil funding levels that we saw in 2009. As I mentioned a moment ago, ago our enrollment growth in those areas that require additional funding have far surpassed this. We should see per pupil amounts that are substantially higher than the 13,500 uh, 13, per pupil. So that's the first story here. The second story you see are the, the three lines all the way out to the right and above are funding levels for Fairfax Co County, Loudoun County, and Arlington County. Dr. Waltz mentioned in his presentation that were we funded at the same per pupil, pupil amounts as those localities, we would see dollar amounts in the range of 260 to $700 million more than we currently receive. This slide is just a different picture of the same thing. You can see from fiscal year per pupil costs between 2018 and 2021 and what you can see is that Arlington, Fairfax, and Loudoun County in the middle of the pack, and as Dr. Dr. Waltz mentioned, we are uh, second from the bottom and have been for 15 years now. The source, source of this information is the Washington Area Boards of Education uh, guides. You see those every year come out, um, and they provide all kinds of comparative statistics between the Northern Virginia localities. So to, to, uh, 
to Dr. Waltz's six um, priorities. The first one, educational equity and academic achievement. In these lists, you'll see some of the items that Dr. Waltz mentioned, and you'll also see some that he hasn't mentioned. And I'm not gonna read through every single one, but I'm gonna hit the high points. First, $5.5 million. That's our increase for economically disadvantaged funding this year. We're approaching, with this increase, we're approaching levels that we saw in 2007. We're not quite there, but we're getting close. Uh, an additional $2 million for special ed teacher assistance, $814,000 to finalize uh, the special ed audit that was done several years ago. Um, Dr. Waltz mentioned $4.2 million in digital equity, uh, $3 million to maintain a $3 million annual reduction for the past four years that we've seen in our uh, Northern Virginia Regional Special Ed Program. Uh, then a couple of additional items, $860,000 uh, for middle, additional middle and high school associate superintendents, uh, $250,000 for survey work, uh, study on homeworks, standard-based grading, testing, and assignments over uh, school breaks. Budget priority number two, teacher employee compensation. This is the biggest piece of our budget, always is. Uh, 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 average 2.8% step plus a 2% COLA equals about $38 million. No health care increases two years in a row. Very good news, good to see. Uh, VRS rates going up. That's an additional $6.2 million to our budget. Uh, these items I don't believe Dr. Waltz mentioned. A $10.2 million uh, phased pay equity compensation plan that really includes two pieces. One is adjustments to our grade 12, which is our teacher's, uh, a teacher grade, and then a smaller compensation or equity adjustment for uh, some coordinators and supervisors at higher grades. And then finally, a $1.37 million increase for bus drivers at the lower end of the scale. Uh, just one thing I'd like to mention before I move on is county government pay plan. I'm sure you've heard of those adjustments that are taking place right now. In fiscal 21, they're going to have to uh, deal with uh, phase one and phase two of their compensation plan, which will cost them $5.6 million uh, for the second year of phase one and then $10.8 million for their phase two. Budget priority number three, pre-K, we're gonna be increasing by $5.1 million uh, funding to support uh, pre-K instruction uh, through a matching program called the Virginia Pre Preschool Initiative, which will add 20 pre-K classes to the school division. Budget priority number four, mental health and wellness, $1.1 million for additional so social workers and $350,000 for a psychologist at the Global Welcome Center, uh, additional nursing position, and a Title IX coordinator. Priority number five, career military and college readiness, about $4.8 million in total. There you see the creation of the culinary program for $1.4 million at Garfield a million dollars in CTE technology investments, those are computers, uh, 300,000 for AP, IB, Cambridge, and a dual enrollment pr program coordinator, and a student internship coordinator, $600,000 for robotics and other innovative programs, and $150,000 for the SAT, ACT uh, prep classes that Dr. Waltz mentioned. Budget priority number six, sustainable, sustainable facilities, school safety, and support infrastructure, $10.5 million. And there you see the, uh, the Brentsville Stadium improvements and the Hilton Turf Field, Dr. Waltz mentioned. About $3.2 million in increased debt service to cover the mortgage on our new buildings. $303,000 for an additional attorney and uh, support staff for that position. And then part of our CIP, not our general operating fund budget, but part of our CIP includes uh, secure vestibules for a couple of our schools 
and then other security enhancements. Those items were discussed on January 11th at the CIP work session. Getting close, almost done a couple of numbers. So this table shows uh, fiscal uh, 20 and fiscal 21 and the change to revenues year over year. You can see the county will be contributing to this budget if it's approved, 54.3, uh, an additional $54.3 million, which is a, about an 8.9% increase year over year. A reminder that includes $31.5 million in excess of the revenue sharing agreement of 57.23% uh, of general county revenues. State revenue increases by about $42 million or 7.6% for a total increase of our general fund and our debt service funds of $106 million between fiscal 20 and fiscal 21. Five-year plan, we like to put the five-year plan up to just to make you aware that this is something that we do every year. Uh, balanced five-year plan is something we do. It's a commitment to fiscal responsibility. It's been an agreement between the county board and the school division for years. And you can see that balance, that plan is balanced. I also like to mention that even though the plan is balanced, there are many other needs the school division sees uh, that the school division has that are not part of this five-year plan. And finally, budget timeline over the next uh, two months. Uh, we have um, uh, on February 5th tonight the presentation. On Monday next week, a public meeting. The 19th, we'll be having a public hearing. Budget work sessions on the 26th of February and then markup on the 11th of March. Uh, with school board approval on the 18th, and then our presentation to the Board of County Supervisors on March 31st, and then on April 28th, the County Board of Supervisors will be approving our budget. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wallingford. Um, as I stated earlier, um, you're going to have a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. You're going to get the materials now um, or soon. And then we will um, fire off questions um, by email to Mr. Wallingford. And um, we will prepare for the public meeting on, when, on Monday. I'd like to remind all board members, you know, this is, especially for our new board members, this is over, you know, this can be, you know, a lot of, a lot of material. And uh, what you see here is a schedule for the budget work sessions can be amended. We can add sessions if we need to. We can um, take sessions away if we don't need them. Um, but um, any concerns board members may have regarding more time necessary to work on, on this, uh, both publicly and um, with the staff, please take advantage of and, and let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wallingford. Any Dr. Latif, if you, I could. I'm sorry, do I have something else? Yes, I do have one comment to make. Yes. I said twice during my presentation that this is a, depart, a departure from the revenue share. What I'd like to do is correct that right now. What we're not doing is we're not uh, walking away from the revenue share. We're requesting funds in excess of the revenue share. The revenue share, just so everybody's clear, is an agreement between the county and the uh, county schools to share 57.23% of general county revenues. Again, this isn't a departure from that. We're, we're just requesting an additional $31.5 million. Which I, which I might add on that in last year's budget that we presented that the board voted on had supplemental slides asking for money over and above the revenue sharing if we had, it was our critical needs list in excess of the the 57%, is that correct? That's correct. And we, we've done that the last couple of years, is that correct? Yes, sir. So this is just, in, in the sense, from a departure, it seems it's just sort of woven in a little bit differently. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Ms. Jesse. Uh, we received something from uh, the Kenny Bodie. Uh, did you receive that information that the Board of Supervisors is making education uh, a priority? Do you know, have any idea what that's going to look like or have you had any conversations? And my second question has to do with preschool education. 
uh, the preschool, uh, there's preschool money, but are we looking at providing the matching funds or are the, is there money now from Richmond where we do not need to provide the matching funds? Those are just my two questions. So, so go ahead and just quickly, I mean, I'll just, just answer. For, um, Dr. Waltz had mentioned earlier in his note that the supervisors voted yesterday on a red for ed and they voted on a resolution saying they're gonna prioritize education funding. We're not sure what that's gonna look like. No, but, and then as far as uh, Mr. Wallingford, if you wanna just answer that question quickly, if you can, if not, um, feel free to send an email out or um, answer that. We'll answer it in writing. Okay, answer in writing. Okay, I think we're gonna move on to, um, Yeah, and, and I think Mr. Wallingford typically reminds us, and, and um, Ms. Williams asked me to just mention that these, are, these numbers are based on forecasted revenues expected from General Assembly's you know, passage of the current governor's proposed budget and the, these what, we, are, what we forecast normally what we get from the county. These numbers are based on the, the governor's introduced budget, yep. which was introduced in, in late December, and the revenue forecasting committee that we jointly serve on schools and the county. And again, you can start it sending your questions now. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to move on to um, board matters, 1901. 1802. 1802. Okay. Mm -hmm. Superintendent's time, please. Thank you. I thought. Congratulations to Hamish Brewer, principal of Fredland Middle School. Mr. Brewer was selected as the Omega U principal of the year. He received this recognition last Saturday as part of the Omega U Black History Month program. The Fred Lynn Steppers performed during this event and we have invited them to our next school board meeting in recognition of Black History Month. Congratulations to C.D. Hilton High School orchestra teacher, Dennis Brown, who has been inducted into the Virginia Band and Orchestra Directors Hall of Fame. This is a very prestigious honor bestowed on few people in our state. Kudos to Kyle Fowler, a junior at Patriot High School who is one of only 29 students selected to serve this semester as a page on Capitol Hill. PWCS has been awarded a grant for Praxis Assistance to support racial diversity among provision provisionally licensed teachers seeking full licensure in Virginia. The grant amount is $10,000. Alvey Elementary School also received a $10,000 grant to develop a robotics curriculum for students with autism. I would like to thank our partners at Walmart who have been generous partners to us in many ways, including supporting programs through Spark. Last week, the Walmart Information Security Team graciously hosted members of our PWCS IT team at their Bentonville Arkansas headquarters to share best practices and collaborate on solutions to information security challenges. They also provided ideas for engaging students in careers in info security. The team at Walmart shared how impressed they were with our PWCS IT and information security. And as they said, they have some of the same problems we do, just a difference in scale and budget. During last month's school board meeting, Ben Kim, student representative, expressed interest in changing school start times. As a result of his interest and a few others, we are beginning to assess the best way to explore this topic within our school division. The school board will continue to be updated at appropriate times. This week is National School Counseling Week, which is sponsored by the American School Counselors Association and is set aside to honor and promote the work that school counselors do. School counselors deliver preventative, social, and emotional programming and connect students and families with resources and support. They are actively committed to helping students explore their abilities and strengths as part of career awareness and development and work with students to set academic goals. We value them as an integral part of our world-class education we provide here in PWCS. I'd like to note that February is School Board Appreciation Month. Our students in schools have sent their appreciation through various displays of artwork, cards, and gifts you see here tonight in the boardroom. I send my sincere thanks and appreciation to each of our school board members 
for the work you do on behalf of our students, staff, and schools. As many of you know, I have the opportunity to engage with many people on Twitter, and earlier you heard from Jana Monaco, the mother of three students who attended our schools. I met Ms. Monaco through Twitter when she shared her heartbreaking story with me about her son, Stephen, who was diagnosed with, I'm gonna do my best on this, isovaleric acid anema, a rare metabolic disorder affecting one in 250,000 people in the US. She has dedicated her time to advocating for the expansion of newborn screening and has been very successful. She has also worked to spread the word about Rare Disease Day, which is February 29th, and was recognized earlier tonight through a resolution. And lastly, I just want to uh, speak again very briefly about the Woodbridge High School concerns. And as I mentioned at a previous board meeting, I want to assure you that we take these matters very seriously. And I also want to clarify the fact that the school board has retained an outside legal firm doing an external investigation to look into the concerns and the investigation is ongoing, meaning there's really nothing that I can say uh, and we don't know what the personnel implications will be, but certainly uh, if there are recommendations, the principal will be responsible uh, to help us with those. We thank everyone for their patience as we ensure proper due process for all who are involved. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Waltz. Moving on to 1901, Revision of Policy 370, General Contract Authority. There's a first reading. Um, any, Mr. Wallingford? Just want to let us know what this one's about. Dr. Latif, members of the board, Dr. Waltz. Policy 370, General Contract Authority. Uh, the revision of this policy has uh, the purpose of trying to update and make sure that those contracts that are and a memorandum of understanding that are outside of the Virginia Public Procurement Act are um, well controlled and managed by the school division. Okay. If... Um as uh, this is the first reading, we'll vote on this in the next meeting. If you have any questions or concerns, please forward them to Mr. Wallingford. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move to 1902. Um, I added this um, just late the other day, um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and bring this up. This is um, for a motion for action. It's a resolution. I'll go ahead and make the motion. Um, I, I would ask that the Prince William County School Board do we have this in language? Am I supposed to read the right? Um, did the Prince William County School Board adopt and authorize the chairman at large to execute? Uh, no, I'm wrong one. Sorry. Is that it? Okay. Okay, yeah. To execute on behalf of the school board the attached resolution. And let me just quickly read through that resolution. That the Prince William County School Board fully supports proposed Senate Bill 578 and House Bill 1012, which are currently pending before the Virginia General Assembly, and which would require the Virginia Board of Education to establish a statewide unified public-private system for early childhood care and education in the Commonwealth. The school board adopts these proposed bills as part of its 2020 legislative agenda and fully supports Governor Northam's $94.8 million early childhood care and education package, which will have a direct and positive impact on the lives of Prince William County students, our school division, and other school divisions throughout the Commonwealth. Um, do I have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I'd like to second. Thank you. Um, discussion? And I'll, I'll start the discussion. I, I'm bringing this up because there's some threat to um, the General Assembly pulling money out of this part of the governor's education budget. And I think there is going to be possible threat to further parts of the governor's education budget. The governor's education budget is fairly historic. It's going to be over $900 million. A lot of that money is going to come to us. And a lot of what we're proposing in the superintendent's budget proposal, which will become our budget, <clears throat> if we adopt many of the things in there, are highly dependent on the General Assembly passing much of what's in the governor's budget. And so earlier in the fall, we vote every year on what we believe our legislative agenda should be. 
um, there's no reason to add to it things that I think the school board would benefit the school board in, in Prince William County and also help us with the budget season. So I'm asking the board to consider the support of these bills, which just barely <clears throat> essentially makes it easier for us to do pre-K investments, but at the same time um, address some of the problems that have been uh, uh, with our inability to do more for pre-K, and that's um, by sort of reducing some of the barriers to do more public-private partnerships to uh, work with organizations to provide um, pre-K with monies that are our monies down in, in Richmond. So if you have any questions or concerns, um, I would humbly and request, for, you know, respectfully ask the board to consider this, adding it to our legislative agenda, and that would allow our lobbyists to then fully um, work down there and add this to the number of other bills that we're trying to push. Uh, the motion has been seconded, and that's in discussion. If anyone has any further questions, concerns, thoughts, um, if not, um, yeah, it's there. We can. I, I didn't. Second was Ms. Williams, yep. Any further discussion? Okay, well, let's call the vote, please. Vote is seven yes, one absent, motion passed. Thank you, Ms. Urban. Um, next, Special Education Advisory Committee uh, reappointment. This is a, um, there's a um, reappointment term for the SEAC Special Education Advisory Council, so um, I'll move this for action. So the, this is um, an appointment the chairman has to make to that committee. It's um, my, the chairman's designee opening, uh, that the Prince William County School Board approved the reappointment of Yukiko Dove to represent Chairman at Large, Dr. Latif, on SEAC for a two-year term. Do I have a second? Mr. Chairman? Ms. Williams? I'd like to second. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman? Oh, I need a second. New one. Sorry. Are we discussing that? Yeah, sure. Discuss. Um, I just think this is a wonderful appointment. Ms. U Dove is a teacher at uh, Leesylvania Elementary School yeah. and also happened to uh, just recently be the Prince William County Humanitarian Award winner for her work in special education. So it's fantastic. Thank you, Ms. Williams. And she's done an excellent job on her term so far uh, with SEAC, and so this is a, a reappointment. Please vote. Vote is seven yes, one absent. Wilk, motion passed. Um, I have a question for um, Division Council. At this point, are we doing board matters? And then we'll go into closed session again. Is that what it's we're up doing? To the, it's up to the chairman. You could okay. defer the board matters till after you come out of closed session, or you so, could do them now. So I, I think we should do them now, as the public waits to hear for these, and then um, we'll go back into closed session, which may take a very long time. So um, we'll start with board matters. I think last time I started, which side did I start at? Okay, this time we'll start with Ms. Adele Jackson. Good evening. This is my second board meeting, and I'm still catching up on what transpired over the last few years and enjoying getting to know more members of my community. I was honored this past week um, to visit Westgate Elementary, and I visited Gainesville Middle School today. Both schools talked about the love and commitment they have to serving, and as Gainesville community says, every child, every chance, every day. I enjoyed meeting them and look forward to working with both principals and the communities they served. As a special educator, I'm a strong believer that it takes a team approach, school, parent, student, to ensure all students access the best education possible. I'm excited to be part of this team and look forward to getting to more schools and more events. In addition to meeting with schools and talking with constituents, getting updated by Dr. Waltz and members of his staff, I was fortunate to attend the One World Gala. It was a great event um, put together by high school students with a commitment to service and science. I'm in awe of the students I meet every day and One World is a great example of our bright future. Many Prince William County students at a very young age, as seen today, are standing up for causes they believe in and I look forward to meeting with them. This month is Black History Month and at home we will be reading children's books to with my kindergartners, I have twin boys, celebrating this month. I ran for school board because of many reasons. One being I wanted to join the collective voices for equity within our school system. Part of addressing equity is making sure everyone's voice is heard 
and considered at the table. I will be posting community office hours in a few weeks on social media and other formats, hopefully. I hope to go into more detail what this looks like next meeting. I want to be mindful when scheduling these meetings of different work schedules, language, and transportation needs. Lastly, it's counseling week. and I've taught for 14 years, and not a week has gone by that I haven't relied on the guidance and support of school counselors. They are vital to our schools, and at the very bottom of my heart, I want to thank all Prince William County school counselors for their dedication to the schools and their community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Wells? Thank you. Um, so this um, has been a busy two weeks um, for the Gainesville District. Um, I've visited seven out of the 12 principals in my district. I have five to go. Um, that's been a really great opportunity for me to get to know the principals and the schools a little bit better. And I have had a good time just getting to know the principals and um, asking them, what are you most proud of and what are your challenges? And so I appreciate um, principals making themselves available to meet with me. Um, I've had a fun time also. I've been to all county orchestra and all county band. Love music. That's um, one of the things I think we do really well in Prince William County. And those students were great. The programs were great. The, um, the directors, the guest directors who came in and conductors who conducted the orchestras spoke so highly of our kids and how hard they work and how dedicated they are. So that was just amazing. Um, I also went to the Western um, Bax qualifying event held at Bull Run. That's a wild and crazy experience if you've never been to a robotics competition. It's so much fun and there's so much energy in the room. Um, and there were some teams that qualified for states out of that and um, there was a lot of hard work put together by the organizers so I want to commend them for that. It's not, it's like a, a birthday party on steroids. I mean, it's just crazy. There's so much work that goes into it and the kids just have a blast. Um, and the Roboticon was held, that was a similar event, but it's held for high schoolers. It's a lot more manageable because high schoolers are usually better managed, <laughs> self-managed, but that was the following day. So um, I think robotics is another highlight of Prince William County. We do it very well in our county. Um, it is um, highly regarded by um, other school divisions. I love that we have this program available for all of our schools and all of our students can participate in it if they choose. Um, and I um, want to just continue um, to express my support for programs like robotics and um, the opportunity for kids to get that STEM background and STEM training. Ms. Ralston. All right, well, good evening. I know we're all having a good time. If we're not, call somebody else, please. Bel Air Elementary School, uh, which is in Neapsco District, uh, has a second year of the Go um, Global School Participant Learning, trained the teachers and staff on how to instruct uh, students using 10 global competencies. Hmm. These include self-awareness, respect for differences, and I could read all of those, but what it's trying, what it's doing, and what everybody needs to learn a little bit about, I know because I didn't know a thing about global schools. And so now that I'm working with um, Bel Air, it's a whole lot easier to understand what they are doing. This is a new program for us, and I know I heard you so many times, so many times. Um, I'm sure that uh, we can, you'll teach us something. I look forward to that. <laughs> uh, and come back and you can, be a, you can be one of the students too. Thank you. Ms. Jessie. Good evening. I wanted to um, shout out really to media for uh, the ladies and uh, ladies who empower at Rockledge, uh, we uh, had a 
video presentation and it was well received. And today I met with those young ladies and I want to thank uh, Mr. Shahan and uh, Communications for providing each uh, student with a copy of that video and I presented it to the young ladies today and they were very, very pleased. Thank you very much. Uh, on the Woodbridge matter, uh, I have to be clear about this uh, because at the last meeting, it, I said that I knew nothing about the board voting for this particular project, and I did not. Now, I'm told that there was a meeting and that I was not present and that there was a board vote for Woodbridge High School, the investigation. I'm not opposed to the investigation. I've always wanted an investigation. I'm not sure I wanted an investigation, a lengthy investigation. I just wanted it solved. It's my district. It's a wonderful school district. And there's absolutely no reason that people need to be in this boardroom three months asking for resolution. I'm not asking you to determine what the resolution is, but it needs to be resolved. And I put that on the desk of the superintendent. When I looked at channel four and it said the school board, and when I heard the superintendent said the school board, I have been asking since August for some resolution at Woodbridge High School. I didn't necessarily ask for an investigation, but I do support the parents. I support everyone who came out because these young men have done a fabulous job. And I want to shout out to Coach Wortham because he introduced me to football and those kids who need SAT tutoring and all the other things that are needed at that school. And he has done a phenomenal job. I was there the day that they had the incident at that school. And I was not allowed in that room. I was told that you're not allowed in the room. I was asked to come there by parents. Someone stood at the door and said, don't let her in. And I didn't go in. Then I walked out and found the police there, three or four or five police cars. They said they were there for another reason. I knew that they were there because the coach had said he was going to resign. So I'm just asking you guys, this is a beautiful school. It's a wonderful school. Solve the problem. Thank you. Lisa Zargapur. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, had a busy couple of weeks. I uh, went to the, um, the Haymakers Steam Expo out at, uh, Jen and I were there, we were hanging out together. It was a lot of fun. If you ever get a chance, if you haven't done it, you've got to go. Uh, there's activities for everybody, uh, young kids, old kids, older kids. Um, got to learn about medical careers, got to learn about internships that uh, our high school kids and our, our high school graduates could be involved in. Um, it's just a really good uh, place to see how STEM works in our world, both in education and beyond. Uh, I also had a chance to go to All County Orchestra. He heard uh, Jen's, uh, was it your, your son was playing, right? Yeah, they were awesome. The best piece by far I thought was Finlandia. Brought back a lot of memories. Um, it was beautifully done. I also got to hear the All District Band, which was uh, my jam when I was a kid. I got to see... Um, a couple of band directors I worked with in the past, and that was really fun. Also went to the Vex Robotics um, competition. Yeah, she's not kidding. It's, it is like a birthday party on steroids. I uh, had seen a lot of people there, who um, parents who were telling me how great it was for their kids to participate in these programs, that they learned not just about robotics, but also about the competition, about how to come up against a problem and not necessarily solve it easily, have to work with other people, and also how to treat each other in a co competitive uh, place. Um, I also, since I wear a hat as a teacher, I went to Richmond for Red for Ed with the Fairfax Education Association, uh, made sure that I talked to a few of our um, legislators. But what I think is really important is sometimes when programming or funding gets cut, it's hard to restore. And so that we have this governor who is trying his best to make sure that we're restoring funding at the SOQs is really significant. When we say it's a historic uh, investment in education, it really is. So I was excited to go down there and advocate for our funding for our schools. Um, 
And uh, not so much, I didn't wear my teacher hat as much as I thought this time. I actually got to, to um, get into some good conversations with Senator McPike and uh, uh, Delegate Guzman. And uh, that's about it. I look forward to the things that are coming for the rest of the month, and I hope you all have a great evening. Ms. Williams. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I had the opportunity to attend a few events um, since our last meeting here. Uh, one that I would like to ha highlight is I was invited to the Chinese New Year celebration by um, the Chinese uh, Community Service Center organization. It was the first year that Prince William County was invited to participate in this event. Uh, my a counterpart on the Board of County Supervisors, Supervisor Angry from the Yapsco District, also attended. Um, we expect to attend in the future uh, per invite by being invited again. Uh, for me, it was an interesting experience and a, and a awesome learning experience in Chinese and Asian culture. Uh, I was fortunate enough to bring my youngest son with me, who I have now learned is absolutely fascinated by Chinese dragons and drummers. Um, and it was really interesting um, to just really see the variety and depth in culture and to learn about tr traditions that go back over 5,000 years. Um, the Asian Community uh, Service Center is a wonderful organization, and I just wanted to Thank them again for the invitation and for allowing us to participate. Um, this is, uh, event is attended also by Fairfax County, Arlington County, and um, I think there were a few representatives from maybe even south of us. So it was just a fantastic event. Um, normally we just go to the mall, and it's a small program. This was a whole another ball game. Um, I also wanted to uh, mention and thank Principal Owens for having me over at Woodbridge Middle School um, to tour the school. I think I rattled her nerves a lot by asking just a ton of questions about Woodbridge um, and her expectations as we enter the boundary discussion, um, which leads me to make the announcement and encourage people to participate in these boundary planning processes early. Um, if you can't volunteer yourself, maybe you know someone who can, and I encourage you to at least stay in contact with that person, share your ideas. There's several avenues for you to be able to provide input. Um, there's quite a few board members, districts who will be affected by this. And because you live in one district, it doesn't necessarily mean that your student will go to school in that district. So I just encourage the community at large to uh, remember to pay attention and participate. Also went to the Omega U Awards. Congratulations to Mr. Brewer. And thank you to our awesome superintendent for inviting the Fred Lynn step team to come and open the school board meeting next uh, in two weeks, I will also be coming with facts on historical, historical facts on stepping, considering it is Black History Month, and because I love stepping, even though I am not coordinated at all to participate in any way other than just putting, pressing play on music, should there be some. Um, I look forward to my uh, visit with Lieselvania, Lieselvania Elementary School with Ms. Yukio Dove later on this week. I wanted to also mention very briefly, I'm sorry, I'm going to run just a tap it over, that I was able to meet with the school, drop in on the school student senate meeting uh, when they had it. They look like a wonderful representation of our school division. I encourage them to keep up their hard work and to continue to hear from voices of students around the county. To our environmentalists who come, just so you uh, know, in case you are not aware, Prince William County is part of a pilot program. We will be having two electronic school buses um, and joining our fleet. I encourage you to stay up with that. And I'd also like to know it, how we could get um, the presentation from the facilities person at the net zero school to come in and provide us with some further education um, and lastly but not least I also want to remind the superintendent and everyone when we talk about equity it's not just about funding it's about programming as well and we know that um, there is a there is definitely a difference in our after-school programming it goes above and beyond our SAT prep that's a great start but I encourage you if you know of a PTA program or a PTO program or an after-school club or an after-school these are volunteer dependent so it's not just how much money your family may have to be able to give but how much time do you have to give that's also an equity everybody can get in where they fit in doesn't always have to be writing a check sometimes it's giving time or making a recommendation but each person plays an important role and I don't want to um, I can't emphasize that enough because it's not always about money sometimes it's about time sometimes it's about love so please don't forget there's many ways to contribute to making our school division more equitable thank you Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, 
Very quickly, thank you, Tahira, Ms. Hamidi, uh, for um, joining us this evening. Thank you for working with the Student Senate. I continue to be um, excited, and I'm very, I'm thrilled with the committees you set up. So thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing the, uh, the results of that work. Um, I want to thank the staff, the principals, the teachers, the stakeholders in the community for working with the school division on what they would like to see in the budget. This is not easy. It's a lot of work that starts really the day we approved last year's budget. And so um, I want to thank all of you. I think it's a courageous budget. I think there's a lot of great things in this budget. I think it's historic. Um, I'm going to point out, because I see some of the voice representatives out in the audience there, uh, Pastor Keith Savage, um, voice was a big part in, in pushing um, some, uh, uh, much of the ideas that we'd love to see incorporated more in public education and in our budget, and, and, and I would ask that, um, that you, along with the public, if you feel excited about what you see and what you hear, to help support um, the governor's package, which will help fund much of what's in this budget, and also um, work with us and the County Board of Supervisors to find ways to um, fund these uh, critical needs that have been chronically underfunded for many years, as pointed out in um, the superintendent's presentation. So thank you for that, and, and, and Dr. Waltz and, and the staff, and Mr. Wallingford, thank you for that presentation, and I look forward to working with you all, and we look forward to working with you all over the next... Um, few um, few days and weeks um, that's really it we're gonna um, we're gonna motion to go into um, a closed session again yeah 22 one and uh -huh. uh, mr. chairman yes pursuant to Virginia code 2.2 dash three seven one one the Prince William County School Board in a closed session for the following reasons one to review the grievance appeal of employee seven I'm sorry T19-79 under Virginia Codes 2.2-3711A1 and H, and two, to discuss the Division Council, a legal matter regarding personnel, uh, regarding personnel T20-30 under Virginia Codes 2.2-3711A1 and seven. Do we have a second? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Williams. A second. Second discussion. Please okay. vote. Before we, um, or after we do this, um, take a 10 minute break uh, before we go into closed session, okay. restroom, all that jazz. Thank you. Okay. And we Vote will... is seven yes, one absent. Wilk, motion passed. Thank you. I'm not sure when we'll resume in open session. Uh, it'll be when we're done with closed session. Thank you. Prince William County School Board is now returning to open session. We have item 2401, which is a closed session action item there um, for grievance appeal of employee T19-79, a motion's in order. Mr. Ms. Chairman. Ms. Williams. I move that in the matter of the grievance appeal of employee T19-79, the school board has reviewed the administrative record and the recommendation of the hearing officer and has decided as follows. One, the grievance shall be transferred to a non-teaching position to be determined by the superintendent. Two, the grievance shall be placed on a formal action plan for one year. Failure of the grievance to meet the goals of the action plan or to receive a meet standards rating on her evaluation shall be grounds for dismissal. Three, the action plan shall be directed towards professionalism, including collaborative relationships with coworkers and supervisors. Mr. Chairman. I have a second? A second. Ms. Jesse seconds any discussion. Please vote. While you're voting, I want to thank the school board for um, all your work on, on these efforts. And, um, and remember, we have um, a public hearing on Monday. So we'll all be back here on Monday. The vote is seven yes, one absent. Wilk, motion passed. Okay, um, next we have to go to 2501, which is the closed session certification of motions in order. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Ms. Ch I, uh, Williams. <laughs> I move that pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3712, the closed session of Prince William County School Board meeting of February 5th, 2020, be certified by adopting the following resolution. 
Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Prince William County School Board hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters that were identified in the motion convening the closed, me closed meeting were heard and discussed or considered by the school board. Do I have a second? Yes, Ms. Second. Ralston seconds of the Neapsco District. Please vote or any discussion. Please vote. Thank you. Vote is seven yes, one absent. Wilk, motion passed. Without objection, the meeting is adjourned.